Jack in three, two, one. Go ahead. Mark Davies with Vigor USA in Houston, Texas. Vigor USA out of Houston, Texas. Uh, first off, what is it that you guys do? Uh, Jason, what we do is we specialize in composite frack plugs, ranging from four and a half inch to five and a half inch, as well as uh, perforating guns. Okay, and you know something like that becomes a little bit technical um, to the average person. Is is there any way that people can, um, I guess, explain in a very mundane, basic? way you know some of these complex engineering things that quite honestly you almost need to see to believe or have you guys got that perfected yet because boy i tell you that's a tough tough goal sometimes well the frack plug what they do is you know it, it all has all an integral part of the actual fracking process during the, the, the completion of the well they'll run the frack plug down hole there's space at different intervals uh the zones are pressured up with the particular plugs and the zones are fracked. The plugs are used to hold pressure between the between the different zones. And then once the zones have been fracked, the uh, the wireline crew uh, is on location, goes down the hole, and drills out the uh, the frack plug. And it's just with a composite material, they drill out a lot quicker and a lot faster than your than your uh, typical uh, iron based. Uh, 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 well, that was my next question, which was um, wh- what it's made out of, and has there been an evolution in, in terms of technology when it comes to these different frack pl- plugs? You mentioned the word composite several times, so that kind of answered part of my question, but explain further. You know, you mentioned uh, um, kind of there's new technology coming in to replace some of the older technology, which would be iron. Um, is what I got out of that. So explain a little bit, uh, you know, the material behind that. Yes, yeah, sir. A lot of the material, it, it, it's a composite material. Some might compare it to like a fiberglass where it can be woven. It can be a, a molded or it can, uh, or it can be a woven uh, composite material that is used to manufacture these uh, particular frack plugs. With them as well, uh, there's, there's very few companies nowadays that don't actually use any metal in the actual frack plug. A lot of companies call themselves composite frack plug companies, but there's very few that uh, are 100% metal free. And, you know, the industry's really changed from going to these uh, composite buttons and uh, moved, started to move away from using the, uh, the, uh, the iron inserts or the steel inserts on their, uh, uh, on their frack slips. Are any of these things becoming smart nowadays? You know, I mean, it seems like everything has a sensor in it or some kind of yeah. microchip. Have you guys gotten to the point point where frack plugs are, you know, making your coffee for you? No, sir. Not, not as of yet. They haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay, well, maybe down the line then. Who knows? Um, you, you know, you mentioned the wireline crew and a few of these other crews. Um, talk to me a little bit about all the different, you know, people that are involved with this, um, you know, that, that, that you run into on a day-to-day basis. One of the things we like to talk about is the energy economy that really happens through the oil and gas industry, you know, everything from the uh, oil companies all the way down to the cafe workers, you know, quite honestly. And uh, you know what I mean by that. So um, what, what, what other, you know, talk to me about who your potential customers are and also who some of your colleagues would be that, you know, that, that you would work with. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that ecosystem that you have. Sure. I mean, just, just to kind of go over, uh, you know, uh, the people that, you know, the oil and gas feed, you know, on, on a typical job, we were on a job uh, last week out in West Texas where, you know, they had a catering company out there that was feeding all the crews. You had the, uh, the frack crews out there. You had the pumping crews. You had the uh, wire line. You had the... Uh, you know, the oil and gas services company, as well as the oil and gas uh, exploration and production crews. You know, you, you might you might have 50 or 60 people at a time out on location. So, you know, and you had everybody from the caterers up to the completions group. So you have such a wide range of people on location. And, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's a long chain of people at this oil and, that the oil and gas industry employs. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Uh, how about some of your customers? Who who would, would be your exact customer? Would it be the 
oil and gas companies, or would it be someone in the middle uh, on, on, on the midstream way? Typically, uh, we like to supply to uh, a lot of the uh, oil and gas service companies. Uh, there are several oil and gas companies where we will sell directly to. But uh, we, we do uh, specialize in selling to the oil and gas service companies ourselves. And what show plays are you in? You mentioned West Texas. Is that typically where all your... <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're currently in the, uh, uh, the Delaware Basin, uh, you know, out, out in West Texas. We're down in South Texas in the Eagleford. Uh, we're also in the Mid-Continent, uh, you know, around DJ Basin. And also we're starting to get back into the, uh, the Northeast as well, looking at the Utica. Oh, you're looking at the Utica. Huh? How about the uh, Haynesville? Any play? Any activity there? Uh, we're seeing a little bit of play with the Haynesville. Uh, you know, it, it tends to get a, the uh, the temperature down hole, as well as pressure, tend to play a lot with these uh, composite frac plugs. And you know, your typical uh, composite frac plug can uh, take temperatures of basically 300 degrees. So, and you know, they go up to about 10,000 psi. So you're starting to get to the limited ranges of the uh, of the plugs when you start talking about uh, the deeper Haynesville over in uh, uh, North Louisiana. Okay, and that was that was the next question I was going to have for you is uh, so many of these different shale plays are so specific. You know, I mean, you, you go up to the Bakken, you're a couple miles below. It's pretty easy to frack. Um, it's a rock type thing. You go to the Tuscaloosa, for example, and that's a little bit more clay, a little more muddy. So you're looking at some different science that's needed there. Uh, do, do, do your frack plugs are they, they? They do have some limits, is what I'm hearing. It, once you get down to a certain point, the temperatures. Is there certain shale plays that you guys just can't really get to with these frack plugs? No, sir. As of right now, from from where we've run them, we haven't run in any any uh, particular zones where we haven't been able to run them. Uh, I would probably imagine that you could not run them in a geothermal situation. That would probably be, you know, uh, the outer limits of any kind of, uh, you know, uh, man-made plug. But as of right now, you know, uh, there's several companies that can handle, you know, temperatures of about 350 degrees or, uh as far as the upper limits of their um, their plugs, with these frac plugs, um, talk to me about a little how it reacts with the sand and the chemicals and that sort of thing. Um, I, I know the sand is is different in all these different plays too. You know, depending on how spherical it is and all these other things. But th- does that really right. matter much, or is it is it pretty much um, resistant or? plays well with all d- different uh, chemistry sets that are going on at each well site. Yeah, you're gonna, what you're going to do, you're, you're going to run these plugs down hole before you uh, pump any kind of uh, sand down hole, and the, you're going to set the plugs. So the pl- basically the plugs, just it's going to be like, like a, uh, a cork in your wine bottle. It's going gonna, it's gonna to set, and the only way you can get it out is, either by, is, by, either, is by drilling it out. That's the only, that's the only way. Okay, then then I am on the same page with what is exactly it is. Cool. Well, let's see. Uh, anything that you think we might have uh, missed missed out on? Anything you want to reiterate? Anything um, we uh, should uh, discuss or final thoughts? Uh, if you would, you know, the floor is yours. No, I just uh, you know, it, it's really nice to see everybody starting to get back to uh, to work and seeing the activity out in West Texas and South Texas pick up again. You know, I, I've had a lot of friends that have uh, lost their jobs over the you know, over the past couple of years due to the drop in oil prices. And it's nice to see people starting to hire uh, individuals again and uh, getting their feet wet back in the oil and gas industry. You know, I just kind of wish, wish everybody uh, the best. I'll, I'll ask you one last question, too, because uh, this has been kind of an ongoing story. And it's fun to get people's opinion on this because it's just more more or less observation that the, the job market within the oil and gas industry in my opinion, has seemed to change in, incredibly to where these aren't, you know, these aren't roughneck slinging chains anymore. I mean, we've got so many more engineers and so many more different uh, uh, trades that are either almost artificially intelligent or robotic or you need, you know, a good deg- specialized degree to do something that it just seems like the job market and employment market has changed so much in the oil and gas industry. Have you noticed that at all? Or do you, uh, to talk to me a little bit about the, just the overall job, 
job uh, yeah, descriptions. It, yeah, as I said, it really has. You know, I know, you know, from the early 80s when I used to work on locations, how, you know, just the attitudes of individuals have changed. Uh, you start seeing a lot more people with with, uh, with college degrees out on locations. The workforce has gotten a lot younger, too. Uh, you know, you're starting to see, you know, guys in their, uh, you know, in, in their 20s, uh, where, you know, back in the 80s, you used to see guys in their, uh, you know, late 30s, early 40s working on uh, on the rigs. So you're definitely, I think you're probably seeing more of a, you're definitely seeing a change in the guard as far as the age of the individuals working on the, on locations nowadays. And as, and then same as, uh, same as, uh, for people making the decisions out on location. You know, that's one of the things that we noticed as well. And we heard that from a lot of the leaders in the oil and gas industry as the industry gets ready to retire over the next five years, like something like. 70% 70% of the industry over the next five to 10 years. And they're, they're very cautious about handing that torch off because there is a younger, more influential, and, at, at, you know, there, there, there's a whole different vibe and a whole different attitude at times. And you mentioned it earlier to where there's almost like a vetting process going on to make sure that the people who are going to get the torch handed to them understand and have a respect for the industry does that make sense yes sir perfect perfect sense you know a, a lot of uh i've got some uh individuals that i i talk with routinely who work for majors who say you know they're they're at the age now where they're they're basically getting you know shown the door and the up-and-coming young engineers who don't necessarily have that on-hand field experience they've got the book experience and you know they've got the classes but they don't have the actual hands-on experience you know, that's something that's not, not not book taught. You have to be out in the field. And you learn this from these, you know, these seasoned veterans who now these companies are trying to get rid of. And, you know, you're going to have all these young people uh, on board who don't ha- necessarily have the, the, uh, the hands-on experience that you need to, to, uh, to drill a successful well. And that, that that's troubling in theory, you know, because, like, for me, uh, I, I went out to the Bakken and um, slept in my vehicle and lived out in the Bakken and did all that stuff so that I could understand what it was like to make a very difficult decision on three hours of sleep with a seatbelt wedged in my back all night. I mean, I, I really had to experience that to understand it. And so you, you, you kind of look at things a little bit different. And when you start to see that, wow, the energy companies are the only ones left that are still talking to the local individuals. I mean, when, when you start seeing those types of things, you, you have a whole different appreciation for the industry that until you live it and work it, you're just not going to understand it, in my opinion. I agree with you 100%. All right. So uh, go ahead and give your uh, business a plug then. Uh, you know, appreciate the time, the information today. So we got to make sure we at least uh, see if we can not get you some business. Uh, go ahead and plug the, your business for everybody. Uh, yes, sir. Well, my company is uh, Vigor, V-I-G-O-R, USA. We're out of uh, Houston, Texas. We sell uh, 100% composite frac plugs, 4.5 and 5.5 and and inch, as well as uh, perforating guns. We manufacture all of our own products, and uh, we ship throughout the U.S. and uh, Latin America on a routine basis. So if we can be of any help... Uh, Feel free to give me a call. I've got uh, 34 years experience in the oil and gas industry, and worked with a large majority of the, uh, the major uh, service companies here in the U.S.